A lot of the time when producing a track, the most important thing to keep in mind is the end goal, what you want it to sound like at the end, what the audience will hear. And every choice that you make whilst producing that track should be made with that end goal in mind. This is a track called What Does Gestalt Mean Again? Uh, it was produced as part of a project called Anti-Global Superpower Club. And I just want to go through and break down the sounds that I got and how I kept that mentality of reaching the end goal as I produced each sound. So this was made in 2020, uh, in August, when not a lot was going on and not a lot of places could be visited in the world. So one thing about this track that's kind of interesting is that it's in entirely produced within the box, apart from the vocals which used a microphone. But everything else, the drums are MIDI and the bass and guitars are all DI tones that I um, dragged sound out of using uh, plugins and um, some, some clever processing and mixing. Like I said, the end goal is something to keep in mind and the end goal with this track was to have a kind of fuzzy wall of sound style production. I wanted it to be really in your face, really kind of grab you, um, heavy on the compression. And so each sound from the main guitar tone to the drums, to the vocals, to the bass, I sort of try to reach that goal. One other thing to keep in mind is that this track, this audio that you were hearing in the video is not run through the mastering chain. So it will sound a little bit different to how the final track actually sounds. Let's start with the main guitar tone. So that's up here at the top, the channel in red. Now, like I said, this is all DI. So underneath all of the effects and processing, this is a very boring, dull DI instrument sound. What I did with this was I did um, parallel processing because I wanted to experiment with that. I wanted to see what kind of sounds I could achieve. So you can see here on this main channel, it holds the uh, actual audio, but it has no output, which means that this channel itself does not uh, output to the main uh, mix channel. But what I did was I outputted it to a couple of buses via aux sends instead, and those are what actually carry the sound. You can see here on this source channel that I've got a few plugins that sort of build up a bass sound. And then what I did was I routed it to this main guitar tone channel and sort of finished it off with um, some little touches that I thought really completed the sound. But I wanted it to sound a little bit bigger. So I also sent that channel to a space channel here, which just adds a little bit of reverb. But I also wanted to sound thicker, so I added this main guitar invert channel to take from the source channel sound without any of the processing here so that it would mix and blend and work in parallel, a bit like if you've ever done parallel compression or distorted in parallel or anything before. Something interesting that I found whilst producing this sound is that this uh, invert parallel channel um, didn't blend great with this channel, and I'll show you what I mean. I'm going to take off the plugins that are on this channel, and I'm just going to solo these and I'm going to play it to you. It's an all right sound, but it sounds kind of thin, especially if you just listen to the main guitar tone. You can hear, even though it's a little bit quieter, it still sounds that little bit fuller because of the uh, bit more in the bass end. And I found, funnily enough, that this was being caused by this channel EQ here. Uh, I wanted to take off the high end and boost the low end so that it had a kind of grungy, garagey tone. But the thing about EQ is that sometimes it can introduce phase problems, um, unless you're using something like a linear phase EQ. This one in particular seemed to somehow delay this track slightly or just do something to throw off the phase. So what I had to do was I had to fiddle with a couple of plugins, namely a sample delay and just a phase inversion uh, plugin to get the sound back. So here's the sound again uh, without the sample delay and gain. And here's it with the sample delay and gain turned on. And you can hear all of that sound just comes right back in. You've got the bass end there. It kind of sparkles that little bit more. It's a little bit like magic. The point of this is that sometimes when you're producing, if you're lucky enough to have the time, the right answer is just fiddling with the sound until you get the sound you want. Um, I was lucky enough that this was a personal project. I didn't have a label or a producer to answer to or deadlines to meet. So I was, I was uh, lucky enough to have the time to really go over and just mess with the sound until I found the tone that I thought was right. And this is an example of that fiddling where for some reason just a phase issue appeared and I had to kind of mess around and solve it. This channel here is just a little bit of space um, that sort of builds up the sound. You can
can hear it working there. And now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to turn off all the plugins uh, in this main guitar tone patch, and I'm going to build them up from scratch so that you can hear where I started and where I ended up. So starting with that clean DI sound. It sucks, no one likes it. So what I did first was um, just a little bit of drive using Logic's pedalboard plugin. Just kind of heats it up, gives it that little bit of fuzz. And then I actually used a bass amp simulator without any cab. It's just a sort of direct out sound. And that was really to get a much sort of crispier tone. And then I actually use the uh, Logic Amp Sim just for the cabinet. This is a um, transparent preamp because I thought it would sound a little bit more like a real guitar recorded, uh, recorded through a real amp if I uh, did this. And it does, it kind of rounds it out. It gives a little bit more low end um, and takes off that kind of harsh top end. And then just a very harsh squashy compressor again thinking about that end goal of having a very wall of sound in your face compressed uh, end product moving on to the main guitar tone channel here uh, there's a noise gate here not entirely sure if that does anything this is a plugin called rough rider it's a compressor um, it's a really aggressive compressor you can see that the ratio right now is 186 to 1 um, it's a bit extreme, but I find that it um, really helps achieve that kind of squashy, aggressive sound. Just makes it pump a little bit more. This is a plugin I actually paid for. I think it's the only um, plugin that I paid for on this entire project, uh, apart from the stock Logic plugins, of course. Uh, it's a sort of one-stop shop for all things saturation. Uh, I use it all the time. I find it's really versatile. It even has a little bit of EQ and dynamics processing here and a modulation section. It's really quite good. I think I got it for £20 on sale. I would highly recommend this plugin. Kind of brings that uh, top end um, hum back. And then again, this is the sort of offending plugin that uh, produced the phase problems, but. In my mind, this made it fit in the mix a lot better just by taking off a lot of that high end and boosting the low end a little bit. From there, we have the main guitar invert sound, which you've already heard. Just bolsters things a bit. And then we've got the main guitar space channel here, which is just a um, reverb. And that is the main guitar sound. The next thing I'm going to go over is this second guitar channel here. Now, again, I said that the main guitar was going to be the core of the sound. It was going to be the thing that sort of drove the whole song through. So this second guitar is really just there to bolster that sound and provide a little bit of harmonic difference. So this is uh, a little bit higher. I'll just play it for you now. And the sound is a lot simpler, um, especially compared to this main guitar channel here. It doesn't look simple, but because it's just linearly processed rather than parallel processed with bus sends, uh, I consider it to be quite a bit simpler. And in fact, it's very much based on the main guitar tone. You can see that we've sort of got the same culprits, the pedal board plugin, the bass amp, the amp sim, Rough Rider, Fab Filter Saturn, even this very same EQ curve. So it's really very similar. And again, it is there to just bolster this main guitar sound. Also has a little bit of complementary pan with the guitar space being panned right here. I decided to pan this one left. That same sound is just duplicated for this third guitar sound here. Uh, I'll just play this together so that you can hear. And the reason it's duplicated like this and pan hard left and right is again to achieve that end goal of a very wall of sound in your face um, production. Leaving it till this late to double up the tracks was a choice that I made because at this point in the track, the track kind of breaks into a slightly bigger, even more in your face sound. So just layering up that, that very same sound. This lead sound is a little bit different. Um, right from the get go, the pedal board involves a little modulation effect here. 
Um, it's kind of meant to be like a rotor cabinet sound and it really changes the overall tone. I'll give you a listen now. You can hear how it kind of widens the sound. It kind of brings in a little bit of extra flavor. It looks a little bit different. The reasoning behind that choice was because a lot of times when I listen to music and think about music, I'm thinking about movement. I think, where is the movement in the track? Where is it moving from and to? It's a little bit abstract, but it really helps me think about each instrument individually and the production of each instrument and decide on what is really driving that song forwards. So um, apart from this uh, spin box effect here, again, it's pretty much the exact same tone, except for the end here where I used a few plugins to just give it a little bit of extra space. That would be the stereo delay plugin in Logic, which I used for a kind of basic widening effect with very, very small delays on the left and right channels and then mixed in so that it just opens it up in the left and right channel. Uh, this is a plugin called A1 Stereo Control that, as far as I'm concerned, is magic. Um, it really does just add width at very little cost, as far as I can tell. I've tested this thing in mono. I've listened to it uh, over headphones, over speakers, in the car, uh, with it on and off. And it always just seems to widen stuff without really sacrificing much in the sort of mid channel. Um, and I found it pretty invaluable uh, when producing things that I think just could do with a little bit of extra width. And then just a very simple uh, delay echo plugin that adds a little bit of a delay just to give it that little bit of extra space and make it feel like it was played in a real room. One thing to note with this uh, lead track is a mistake actually that I made. Whilst I was producing this track, uh, I must have slipped up, made a bit of a rookie error because I wasn't checking in mono very well. You can hear that this sound sounds great, it sounds big in stereo, but if I take this uh, directional mixer plugin, which essentially just sums to mono, and I turn it on, You can hear that quite a bit of sound is lost, and in fact, if I play it in the mix, you'll really hear what I mean. You can hear that some to mono, it doesn't have nearly the same impact as in stereo. Um, normally this wouldn't be a problem, but it is very good uh, mixing technique and practice to check your mixes in mono as you go just to make sure that you're not getting too much cancellation when you sum to mono. This I would consider a little bit of a mistake because it doesn't quite have the same impact in mono, which I would be a little bit upset if I heard this in mono, you know, over a phone speaker or whatever, and it didn't have quite that same punch as it does in stereo. So just something to keep in mind. The only other guitar uh, tracks that we have is creatively named Uh-Oh here. And this is just a bit of a layer track. There were just a couple of parts in this song where I thought it could have a little bit more detail, a little bit more harmony. And I'll just sort of um, show you what that means here. Uh, this is a very simple track. It's just um, the same thing sort of played in left and right, double tracked, and then sent to a single bus that just has... Uh, a pretty standard amp sim in Logic, followed by a bit of a uh, mid-low boost and then a little bit of distortion and reverb just to help it along. And it sounds a bit like this. So it just helps out the mix on the whole. It kind of bolsters this lead part in particular. and sort of makes it seem like I am a better guitarist than I am by having two parts play over that are almost indistinguishable. An example of that layering is particularly prominent here at the end. I'll just play you the lead sound on its own. So it's kind of a fluffed part, but I thought I wouldn't go back and fix it in the original take. I would just record something else over it. Like that, and it just kind of completes it. Maybe a little bit lazy on my part. Maybe I could have just gone back and re-recorded this guitar part, but I thought that this worked just as well. Uh, and it was a slightly quicker solution um, over just playing the part better. Moving on now, I'm going to go over the drum sound next. So again, this was all produced using MIDI uh, in the box in Logic, uh, even using a stock Logic drum kit. Um, this is one of the sort of 
plus drum kits uh, that Logic has if you care to download sort of the extra stuff that you can get for Logic. Sometimes I need to do a little bit of trickery uh, in the mix, adding parallel processing or little layer sounds for the snare. But on the whole, this is really quite good for what it is. So first thing I want to talk about is the kick and snare. You can uh, see that there's actually a channel from the drums outside of the main folder. Uh, for the drums and it does indeed send to the stereo out rather than everything else which sends to the bus aux channel here and the reason for that is again because of the production choices that I wanted to make in the attempt to reach the end product of a very big in your face sound and that is that the kick and the snare needed to sound massive uh, I'll demonstrate now uh, sort of how massive I managed to get them sounding here And again in the mix. So that kick really punches through and you can actually see if I just give you a bit of a wider track overview here, you can see that the kick drum there is pretty much the loudest thing playing by far. Um, and that is why I sort of removed it from the folder here so that I could have it a little bit um, less hindered by whatever I slapped on the drum bus. As for the snare, I started out with something pretty boring and simple on the whole. You can hear there it sounds just like a standard snare. One thing I added was this uh, little bit of reverb. which funnily enough, despite being reverb, makes it sound closer to the listener. And then a little bit here as well of distortion. To give it that very mid-range punch, which I found really helped it cut through the mix. The last thing I added to the snare was actually a whole separate layer. This is actually just noise. And I thought that the snare could just do with a little bit of brightening, a little bit of sparkle, so. Really barely audible, but I found that in the final mix, it really helped out. I'll just demonstrate that now. Really helps that kind of drier snare sound really come through to the front of the mix. As for the rest of the drum sound, it's generally pretty simple. I don't really want to get too into it because there's uh, sort of just a lot going on on each channel, um, but nothing too complicated. So for example, the overheads, just a channel EQ and this kick in, some pretty standard kick processing. Little 78 hertz boost, pretty close to 80 hertz, which is where a lot of the thump in a kick drum is. Over here, they've got a couple of room sounds. I actually routed the snare sound to a mono room sound, and everything else is routed to a stereo room sound. <laughs> can hear that there and again that was to make sure that the snare kind of came through the middle of the mix and really burst out of the rest of the drum kit even though it's not the most spectacular snare sound. There is actually a drum reverb track here. Uh, you can see it's just got a reverb on and ah this is another paid plugin Sausage Fatner that I got a while ago. Um, it just kind of makes things bigger and this you can see is actually muted. That is because I used automation to switch it on only halfway through the track. That is again the same spot over here at this little bridge marker where I wanted the third guitar layer here to come in because I wanted the whole track to kind of open up even more at this point. And I'll just sort of show you the difference now. So here's some of the drum sound in another chorus. And here's the drum sound when the reverb is unmuted. Just makes it that little bit bigger, that little bit more in your face. Something to keep in mind with this drum sound is that it has a lot of that fuzz sound going on. Like I mentioned at the start, I wanted it to be kind of a fuzzy sounding song. And something interesting that I've sort of found out over the course of production is that 
For one thing, yes, getting a great sound at the source is really important. The performance matters, the room matters, and the microphones and pickup and everything matters. But if you can't really get that, for example, if you're stuck at home in the middle of a global pandemic, something that can give you a slightly different sound that also sounds pretty good is just a lot of processing and a bit of filtering and fuzz and distortion. Uh, it's a little bit like in photography, if you use a filter really well, it'll kind of color the image. It'll give it a little bit of a different flavor without you really noticing when you're just looking at the photograph. And I found that the same applies in audio. If you can get the listener to not even realize that what they're hearing is a slightly different sound, you can get away with doing a lot to a sound. Moving on, I want to talk about the bass sound here. This is a fairly stock standard bass sound. There's nothing crazy going on. I'll just play it in solo now. It's just pretty kind of fuzzy and heavy and, and deep sounding. Um, I'll just run through the plugin chain very quickly just to give you an idea of how I got the sound. So starting out with a noise gate, I find that that really helped the punch come through. For some reason, it just, you know, sounds a lot more uh, punchy and, and active and dynamic when you really mute those, those quiet sections. Next thing I used was a multiband compressor. Um, I find that really having your bass frequency area of your bass guitar sound locked down really helps it uh, lay down a mix properly. It can really just form the foundation for everything else to sit on top of. So that just makes sure that the low end of the bass guitar really uh, stays consistent. Um, a bass amp simulator. Uh, again, kind of using roughly the same technique as the guitar where I used a bass amp simulator for the amp head here to get that initial crunch. A little bit of an EQ in the middle, but then it roots to uh, a transparent uh, amp simulator with a just cabinet just to give it that sort of cab sound as if it was played through a real amp in a real room. Then we have a, another multiband compressor that does exactly the same thing as the first multiband compressor because, again, I was fiddling with this project. I had the time, I had the resources to just sit there and play with the sound, and I found that this just got me a sound that I was really happy with in the end and that I thought really sat well within the mix and reached that end goal of having it be that in-your-face sound. And again, to cap off the chain, Fab Filter Satin, it's great. Uh, this I'm actually splitting the signal into two separate bands. So again, multi-band processing. You can hear here in uh, band one, which is sort of the bass uh, end, there's very little drive. And here in band two, which is the top end, there's lots of drive. The other thing to mention is that I used a fairly standard technique when producing uh, a bass sound like this, and that is to just add a little bit of width by sending to a bus here and having that bus with a chorus effect on it. And that is this channel down here. So I'll play it without this uh, widening effect. The core sound is still there, but with this channel active, it just fans it out, it spreads it out. And I found that I didn't lose too much when I summed to mono. So I was very happy with this sound. You'll notice that there is another bass channel here, and that is just because I thought partway through the song there was a particular section where I thought the bass could do with a little bit more pop, and that's here. You can hear that it just kind of gives it that little twang, that top end boost, that little bit more grab. Um, you can hear the compressor working a little bit harder uh, over two channels and it just helps. Something about this bass sound is that you hear when it's solo that there is a lot of top end information going on. You can really hear that there's a lot of crunch and distortion and fuzz, but in the mix, you barely hear any of it. So you might wonder why bother keeping any of it in if it's just going to get masked out by other instruments, uh, other parts of the mix. And one answer is that you don't have to keep it in. It would have been an equally valid choice if I wanted to add in a channel EQ and just take off a lot of the top end like this.
it sounds pretty much the same because a lot of the high frequencies are just masked out in solo. You can really hear the difference though. So why bother keeping it in? Wouldn't that just eat up your headroom if you have masking frequencies going on? Uh, maybe it would. Maybe it would eat up your headroom. But when I was mixing this, when I was producing it, I was listening to it as part of the mix. I was sort of A-Bing plugins and effects and I was summing to mono and I was checking my work. And I found that I just liked it better, that little bit of sound that you do get through the top end, I found worth keeping. Uh, and particularly, you know, for parts like this where it's a little bit more isolated, it's worth keeping it in there as well. As far as masking goes, it kind of is a personal choice. You might lose a little bit of headroom by leaving stuff in that you could take out with a filter, but I just found that I liked having it in and I liked it being there because I knew what the tone was underneath and I could sort of hear it a little bit when it was pumping through the rest of the mix. The last part of this mix to talk about is the vocals. These vocals were all recorded with an SE Electronics R1 ribbon microphone. Uh, I like that mic. I like its slightly smoother dynamic. Um, I don't mind losing a little bit of top end with it being a, a, a ribbon microphone. I find that it's not too difficult to sort of add it back in or just work with it in a track and, and make it fit the mix. Um, and it was all recorded just in my bedroom at home um, to get the sound. And again, that was the same with all the tracks on Anti Global Superpower Project. It was all recorded at home with one microphone and the rest was done in the box. Funnily enough, you can actually tell by the track naming that these were the scratch vocal parts, um, these main vocal parts here. This is what I recorded when I had just finished writing the lyrics and I wanted to have something to listen to so that I could sort of think about it, think about the performance, think about the emphasis on each word, and maybe go back and redo later. I did go back and redo these vocals, but I ended up deciding that I liked the delivery of the scratch vocals better, so I just kept them in. And it's funny how often that can happen when you're making music. You know, a, a lot of tracks, one that comes to mind is uh, Song 2. Uh, that was just scratch vocals that were recorded sort of standing over the mixing desk as they were, you know, debating what kind of lyrics to put in and how to have them in there. So just a funny thing about the vocals on this track. Them being scratch vocals means that it is not the greatest performance in the world. It is not my best work. Uh, but it suited the music. And again, it's all about suiting that end goal. They were a little bit scraggly. They weren't quite uh, in key. They were just a little bit all over the place. But I like that. It felt a bit messier. It kind of suited the fuzzy in your face wall of sound thing a little bit better. So I'll just play you one vocal sound. Debate on the internet does not make sense. At some point, the only question left is do you care at all? Not the best, but it suits it. You can see that I've got a little bit of a processing chain going on here. I'll just sort of run through what each of these does because I find that it's really useful to know exactly how vocals are produced. So starting out with uh, just a, a bass cut filter here. Debate on the internet does not make sense. Just to clean up any kind of pops or low end rumblings because again, these were scratch vocals. I didn't really pay too much attention to how they were captured. Followed by a compressor. Debate on the internet does not make sense. At some point, the only question left is, do you care at all? Yes, 20 decibels is a lot of compression, but it is mixed in. This is a bit of parallel compression. It's just to sort of help keep the core of the sound there to prevent it dropping too low in the mix, uh, whilst not having the whole sound completely squashed out by compression, followed by a little bit of uh, EQing. Debate on the internet does not make sense. At some point, the only question left is, do you care at all? Makes it kind of a thin sound, followed by this, which EQs that to sound even thinner with a little bit of treble boost and bass cut using uh, FabFilter Satin for saturation. Debate on the internet does not make sense. At some point, the only question left is, do you care at all? You can actually start to hear the room sound uh, come out when this plugin is turned on because, again, these were scratch vocals. I just recorded them in a pretty rubbish sounding room um, in sort of my room that I was using for production at the time. A phaser mixed at 2% wet. I'm not really sure why this is here, but I guess I must have thought it sounded good back when I was making it. Debate on the internet does not make sense. At some point, the only question left is, do you care at all? 
honestly, if I were producing this now, I might have even just removed that plugin. Um, but I left it in there. Diessa. Debate on the internet does not make sense. At some point, the only question left is, do you care at all? You can see that it's working not really hard, but really consistently. I had the threshold pretty low for this. I found that just removing a lot of the top end entirely throughout the whole vocal performance really just gave it that kind of telephony breakup that I wanted. Um, because again, it was about uh, serving the end goal of this track, and that was to create something that was a little bit raw, a little bit sort of filtered, fuzzy. And the last thing in this uh, chain is, again, a very simple widening technique of left and right channel, very small delays, and then mixed in slightly uh, with the dry signal. Debate on the internet does not make sense. At some point, the only question left is... Just like that. And that is the sort of main vocal sound. You can see this second vocal channel here is a lot of the same plugins, but with just some of them turned off. This was just to thicken the sound a little bit, give it a little bit more. And again, this one doesn't actually have the widening uh, in it. So it just uh, allows for a little bit more of the mono sound to come through. It means that it will also sum to mono a little bit better, which is an important thing to check when you're mixing. Debate on the internet does not make sense. At some point, the only question left is, do you care at all? Other vocal channels are just for a little bit of extra width and, and texture and flavoring. So this one you can see is panned off slightly to the right and it just boosts uh, this last line here. Hey, how's life in the fast lane? Are you so truthfully happy letting other people die as you point and call someone else the bad guy? Kind of a creative choice just to double up the vocals there. And over here, again, it's kind of roughly the same sound. Hey, how's life in the fast lane? Are you so truthfully happy letting other people die as you point and call someone else the bad guy? Just like that. The other vocals here are the sort of gang vocals for the chorus. I'll just give you an idea of what they sound like all together. It's a hive mind, a crowd mentality. Leave the sick behind in this false dichotomy. And I don't mind. So it's just a bit of a, a more of a group sound, makes it a bit bigger, makes you think that more people are singing than there actually are, uh, which is just me. But these are all roughly the same. They're a lot simpler than the uh, processing chain for the main vocal sound. And that's because I found that with multiple uh, vocals playing at the same time, it kind of helped smooth over any little, you know, errors in the mixing or in the performance. So I found that it just needed a little bit less processing. You can see there are a couple of bus sends here. And this is to a reverb that you can see down here. And what this does actually is Space Designer, I set to invert the left and right channels, uh, the panning of the left and right channels. And that's a technique that I found really, really useful when I want to widen a source without introducing uh, any kind of phase issues is to just um, send to a reverb and invert the pan of that reverb so that the left channel reverb is playing over the right channel dry sound and the right channel reverb is playing over the left channel dry sound. There are a couple of extra bus sends here. This one is Again, kind of doing that same thing of just uh, inverting the left and right channel and then delaying the sound rather than reverbing it. And then you've got this channel here, which is just a little bit of distortion using Fabville the Satin again. The master channel down here, uh, the channel that everything else runs through, has a little bit of uh, mix bus processing on it. Not too much, just a little bit to kind of get that sound that I wanted. Here we have just a little dip around here. I just found that there was a little bit too much there. A compressor. This is actually a free compressor that I use a lot on my mix buses. Um, I find that it just glues things really nicely. It doesn't really sound too much like a compression. Uh, it's just a little bit smoothing uh, over the sound. I actually used it pretty aggressively on this track because you remember I mentioned that this kick out channel is really loud. Well, that means that it is the thing that is driving this compressor the most, which gives it that kind of pumping kind of club sound. You can hear that and see that here. You 
can hear it just kind of livens thing up uh, livens things up it makes the kick kind of control the whole dynamic of the mix which um because this is a little bit dance inspired uh, of a track i found really helped kind of bring the sound together the only other processing uh, that's on the master bus is this plugin which is vinyl i'm pretty sure this is free or at least i got it when it was free um it might be paid now it's by isotope it's really useful it's just kind of a little bit of i guess you would call it degradation it just uh, takes a little bit of the high end off and introduces a little bit of saturation and can introduce some noise. Um, and the reason that this is on the uh, main output bus rather than any individual bus is because I found uh, similar to what I was talking about earlier, like filtering photographs. If I filter the whole track on the whole, then the listener will hear it and that will just be the sound. You know, there won't be anything to compare it to necessarily. They'll just hear this slightly rolled off top end that vinyl provides, these slightly fuzzed up mids and lows. And the listener will just think, ah, this is just what the track sounds like. And for me, I wanted it to sound a little bit more fuzzy and distorted. So I just use this plugin. On the other side of the right, You can hear the main thing that it's doing is just taking off the top end. The very last thing I want to talk about is just my monitoring uh, and my sort of checking plugins that I use to check things. So one thing I do actually is I use an EQ on the output bus, um, a lot like this one. Uh, this one is actually doing something for the sound, but what I would always do is just have a big old low cut so that I could check the bass. That really helped me make sure that my kick and my bass uh, sound were really sort of playing ball together. They were just working off one another and one wasn't drowning the other out. That I will just turn on and off sort of periodically to check my bass end. Level meter is always useful to have, just a basic one. Uh, you've seen me use this. This is just summing things to mono. And one thing that I use this for as well is in conjunction with a reverb like this. And this is because of a tip that I read about a long, long time ago, where if you're mixing something and you wanna just give the overall mix a little check, just make sure that everything is balanced, what you can do is you can just step outside of the control room and leave the door open and listen to the whole mix in the room next door, if that's you know the live room or a little chamber in between. Uh, and this sort of sums it to mono and gives a little bit of room characteristic so that you can sort of hear a little bit of what's going on without being too close to the mix. Because oftentimes I find that when listening for a long time, I get really used to the mix and it doesn't really sound like a mix anymore. It just sounds like music. So what this does is it just adds that reverb as if I was in the next room over. And then what this uh, summing to mono plugin does is it makes it as if I was listening to it through a door frame because it's sort of one singular sound. This is something that I will periodically turn uh, on and off just to check my work, check that everything's okay, check that no one particular element is, you know, massively standing out or way too bright or way too dark. And, you know, is the kick there? Is the snare there? That kind of thing. And then these last two plugins are my kind of uh, heroes when it comes to checking my work and making sure that my mixes will translate. This is Voxengo's Span. It's a spectral analyzer. And this is the Yulin Loudness Meter 2 free version um, and this is a sort of dynamics level meter and these are both free you can go and download these right now for whatever daw you use and they are so useful and fantastic and amazing the span i have set to this mastering set that i have and that just smooths everything out so that it gives me a very smooth idea of what the whole mix sounds like uh, on a spectral analyzer and this loudness meter actually measures uh, both in sort of true peak max decibels but also does a lot of measuring using loudness units loudness units are a fantastic way to measure things they're a very sort of modern way to measure things uh, compared to something like decibels or a vu meter and using these two plugins i can kind of just make sure that my mix isn't massively squashed i can just check you know that my ears are telling me what i think they're telling me in the uh, frequency front oops let me turn that off
So you can see I've got quite a nice dynamic range here, 12 loudness units, and you can see this curve. It kind of has a lot going on in the bass and then just curves gently down up to the high end, which I often find is a very nice, pleasing frequency response for a track to have. Something to remember with monitoring and checking plugins like this is that they are there to help your ears. They are not replacements for your ears. You've always got to check and trust with your ears before you use any plugins. These are purely for my sort of, uh, for me to be sound of mind when I'm checking things. They are backstops and uh, assistances rather than the main tool that I will use. The main tool that you use when making music should always be your ears. That wraps it up here. You've sort of seen all of the sounds that I got and how I got them. The ethos that I had was just sticking to that idea that I had, that sound that I wanted to achieve at the very start when I set out. And yes, things will change as you go. You will decide on different things. You will make little alterations. But having one thing, kind of a, a core pillar that you can stick to as you go through and you record, you mix and you produce, really does help you get a sound that you will be happy with in the end. You can find this track in a link in the description. It'll take you to my Bandcamp where this is free to download. You can also find this track on any streaming service that you would probably care to mention or listen to. Thank you very much for watching. I hope that you found this uh, informative and that it's helped you kind of gain some insights into sounds that you can achieve in the box whilst reaching for a specific sonic goal. Bye.